computer. Hi, FOMO. Welcome hey. to the show. Ah, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I just got kind of cool being in the other side of things. I usually I'm the one with all the questions, but now I have to have answers. <laughs> I know, I know. And I, you know, sorry for calling it the show. It's like the first one, and uh, this is That's just a show. It's it's a show. Okay, it it just became a show because you're here. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, um, my name is Pandu, uh, and uh, decentricity is uh, what I am on Twitter. And uh, I'd like to introduce my, my very good friend, Flobo Voice here. Um, and uh, actually, I should let Flobo introduce himself. Uh, Flobo, would you like to introduce yeah. yourself? Yeah, I sure as heck do because I love talking about me. Um, what what? How do I do? I always tell my I tell people when I meet them, I'm a live entertainment professional. Whether it's the stand up stuff or the DJ stuff or the podcasting stuff, if it's live, usually I'm the one that that loves doing that. Uh, originally from New York City, live in Los Angeles now. Been out here for I learned I looked this up. This August will be 15 years I'll be in Los Angeles. So that'd be kind oh, of fun. Wow. Uh, I know I'm old, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's been so much fun to entertain. We're the same age. <laughs> I'm so. old. Whether you make it look good is up to you. I know I'm old. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, when we met, like this is this is how we met. We, uh, I was I was looking for someone who can you know help me do podcasts uh, and uh, get get my story out, uh, which is a separate story, other podcasts. And uh, I I really want to know like uh, how did you get into uh, podcasting? Um, was this something you you just started doing uh, after the pandemic, or did you start doing it before? I really don't know. I mean, like, yeah, it's, it's yeah. Kind of like Two, two different eras in my career. Like the, I, I dabbled with podcasting before the pandemic, but I had all the wrong expectations. My first ever podcast, I think you can find it, uh, or the last six episodes, it's called 26 Stone. Uh, it's, for those who don't know, stone is a unit of measurement. It's 14 pounds. And at my heaviest in my life, I used to weigh 26.9 stone. And it oh. was talking with my friends. And I thought it would be kind of cool, but it, it got kind of really lame. And no one really bought in, and the ratings were terrible. So I kind of like ended there, but the, the podcasting network and this iteration of new Amsterdam entertainment of which there are seven podcasts I host, including new Amsterdam radio that came from the pandemic because I was a stand-up comedian that wanted to build a fan base, wanted to perform, but then I couldn't leave my house. And it was like, well, how do I do that? Uh, on my show, I say this, but the whole world told me that I was non-essential and to stay home. And so I decided to do shows from my house. Okay, um, so a lot of a lot of the uh, uh, way you do podcasts, so seven podcasts, right? So there's, mm -hmm. there's a like it's a, you don't have a set genre, like it's not it's not just comedy podcasts, it's not just press. Like you do Star Trek yeah. podcasts too, right? Yeah. So, did that just come about organically, or? So for me, it was I was looking at things from, from com comedy first, right? Yeah. Uh, except for New Amsterdam. New Amsterdam Radio is where I really want to sit and almost like a therapeutic session and to show other people how they can start their business or start their, their creative pursuit. But every other podcast I do, I say, how can I do this in a way that doesn't take itself so seriously? So I'm a big wrestling fan, but I'm also in my mid thirties and, and usually wrestling is associated with kids. So I understand that. So I try to put jokes about what I'm watching with a wrestling show. Star Trek, uh, I got into Star Trek three years ago. I'm into Star Trek Discovery. And for those who don't know, that's like one of their like newer series. And so being a yep. fan almost in reverse, to me, it's funny. And so I have a show where I'm like, well, what's a Klingon? Tell one, tell me. You know what I mean? And I get to be totally <laughs> like dumb. And my, my co-host tries to like, walk me through it because I get to be blind. So I always approach everything comedy first. So yes, the shows are random. But to me, it's like, how can I make this as entertaining as funny as possible? Okay, I, I I seem to see like uh from like from the Star Trek perspective, like there's probably like a lot of people out there who, who have like Star Trek podcasts and a lot of people out there have comedy podcasts. How do you sort of differentiate yourself like uh, from those other podcasts? Yeah, first thing I consider myself a fan of it. Uh, I think it's very even though I have a platform and when you have a podcast, you do. It's very easy to go. I can't believe what they're doing. They're doing this wrong. I would have done this. And the answer to that is. Uh, well, if you feel that way, right for the show, right? When we have a show like NXT and NXT UK, which are wrestling shows, that's three hours of wrestling a week. 
So if someone just watches those shows, three hours of wrestling, and then watches our show, we're going to be as pleasant as possible. If something's ridiculous, we make fun of it. Yeah, but we want to make sure we're, we're giant fans too. And the Star Trek experience to me was interesting because fans are so protective of that IP. But what I've learned is that everyone has a different interpretation of what they think Star Trek is. So me being dumb and asking dumb questions, like, well, why does that care? Like, oh, I didn't like, this, for example, I don't like Star Trek Discovery because uh, Burnham was never mentioned as Spock's sister. But in Star mm -hmm. Trek, the movie too, Kirk has a son and that wasn't mentioned. Like what? <laughs> so yeah, so to I mean, me, it's kind of funny how, so yeah, to go navigate that. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the guy's uh, family, right? Like, yeah, uh, working family, uh, something <laughs> fierce, right? <laughs> uh, right. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, um, what about like the, uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, things that are sort of, um, um, I mean, toxic fan base has almost sort of become uh, sort of a buzzword. I guess it's been repeated. Like, uh, mm -hmm. it happens. Um, how do you, like, um, uh, have you ever experienced uh, something like that uh, within your fan base? And if not, how do you avoid that? Oh, I don't have any fans. I wish I did. Uh, Come on. <laughs> okay, no, but my fans are great, man. My fans are, are great because they kind of know where I came from. They know that <laughs> my my personal fan base. Uh, they know where I came from. I'm kind of a, a goof, and and I, I I was a fat kid with immigrant parents that that <laughs> made something fun. Uh, but as far as like the toxic fan bases I deal with, primarily wrestling and Star Trek, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. Just know that they exist and everyone tries to extract what they think should happen in wrestling or what they think Star, uh, Star Trek is. But there's a lot more good people. When I said I, I'm into Discovery and I went to Reddit and I was like, does anyone feel the way I do? So many people came out and go, oh, Discovery is my favorite, for example, mm -hmm. or in wrestling. I like wrestling because I'm from a time where kids got beat up for liking wrestling, but now we're so used to it. Nerd culture is so cool. We can pick and choose promotions and matches and wrestlers and say everything's the worst. So it's kind of cool. It's a double-edged sword, but kind of cool that you can look through the toxic and find more people who are about the good of each mm -hmm. franchise, each fan base. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, finding the good and the bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something like that. So, um, uh, do you have the uh, have you, do you do any music podcasts? Uh, I, I haven't like I know you DJ. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. Uh. No. Not so much. I like okay. having musical guests because I can. I can. Was was what makes New Amsterdam Radio so cool is that I can mm -hmm. have issues like that when I don't want to have my own podcasting because i love baseball for example and i have baseball guests but i don't think i'll do a baseball podcast quite yet uh i like dabbling with music but i don't think i'm a music authority i dj for events for weddings but to the outside looking in that's not seen as like qualified mind you on the netflix show i have a film degree and the wrestling show i worked in wrestling for 10 years the star trek show i say i don't know what i'm talking about but i'm also a comedian so it's a, so i have a little bit of expertise i think it's really very important no matter what show you launch that you come with a little bit of a listen to me because <laughs> so i couldn't do that with sure. music i don't think yeah because you do you do need to have a perspective right and uh, that perspective is one of your experiences um mm -hmm. so and and you uh you have DJ like semi internet well internationally right like I, I read your book and this is your book oh yeah by the way right here <laughs> cool book <laughs> graduation day available now <laughs> all right available now on Amazon um and yeah, uh, yeah so uh, you you uh, how did you get into uh, DJing and how did you get those gigs in Europe and uh, everything uh, mentioned oh, in the yeah. book? that yeah. that was interesting um, so in 2015. Uh, many, many times in my LA journey, uh, I've been employed. I was unemployed for a long time. Uh, I, I'm over, basically I'm overqualified for most of the lines of work because I have an, I have an, a master's degree, but I work in entertainment. So a lot of times I will hire you for office jobs. And so in 2015, I answered an ad on ZipRecruiter for an MC because I've been doing things in my voice since I was a kid, you know, I, wrestling, announcing, all that stuff. And it turns out it was a DJ company um, if I'm, this is really lame and boring, but there's some companies here in, in LA that are basically DJ farms where oh. they basically go for volume and you book with them, they'll sign you a DJ at a discount. So I basically worked my way through that. Uh, I was MC, most DJs know the music, but not the speeches, but since we do weddings and events, 
the things are also as equal. So I taught the other DJs how to project their voice. They taught mm -hmm. me how to spin. And I, mean, I did that with this company for about two years until I had a bit of a falling out with them in 17. And I started my own company when my day job let me go on Thanksgiving Day. That's actually in the book as well. <laughs> uh, so, okay. so basically I was kind of stuck. Thanksgiving Day, got, I got a phone call saying, hey, look, you no longer need you in corporate America. I had my DJ deck in my, my, my closet. I had quit that multi uh, DJ company before. I started launching my own business then. And it was difficult because you know the United States doesn't make it easy to launch your mm. own business. Uh, but I found oh, a way to make that happen. And as far as Italy, no. Um, it, there's other countries that are a lot worse. Mm. Like India, for example, is like the tour minority kind of understood as go ahead and do it. So you're spending hours and hours trying to figure things out and, and there's no support networks and that they are, they're scattered. There's a bunch of landmines and to get behind the curtain in the Southern California wedding space, venues have vendor lists where they prefer mm -hmm. vendors that clients work with. Well, the game is how do you get to be in a vendor list? And that's the thing that a lot of minority vendors deal with. A lot of women vendors deal with. Because oh, even you okay. can say, oh, we have a relationship with XYZ company and XYZ company is old brick and mortar. You know what I mean? It's got a billionaire it. boys got club, it. that kind mm. of thing. Uh, yeah. So that's been difficult. So I, I got a, a client that was Italian American uh, back in 2018. Uh, yeah, 18. Uh, uh, she was a Italian American getting married in Italy back to her homeland. And she didn't want to book an Italian DJ because she wanted some American songs in there. And I couldn't afford it. I was so new, like I didn't know anything about like paying for insurance or advertising. I was throwing money anywhere just to get my name out there. So I was broke, but I took the gig uh, because I said, if I will go over there as like a teachable moment, maybe I can show this client that I'm able to do whatever they want. And, yeah. and, and I go in detail on this in graduation day. Basically, I, I went on a shoestring budget. I got a discount flight on Norwegian Airlines <laughs> from LA <laughs> to Rome. Uh, stuffed my bag full of beef jerky and stroop waffles. Oh, no. yeah, I didn't. I, yes, <laughs> I know it, I it's, get it. it's awful. I, get it. <laughs> I I had like I had like three meals, like three Italian meals that week, because uh, I wanted to show I can do it. And I said, if I get the content, then maybe mm -hmm. I can show people, hey, this guy is so good and in demand, he's being mm -hmm. flown out. It's kind of like mm -hmm. what Red Bull mm -hmm. Red Bull did when they first launched put the the empty cans of Red Bull and trash cans all around town to generate buzz. Hey, what the heck is this? Huh. It worked out. Uh, I came back, I lost about 700 euro when it's all said and done on the wedding. <laughs> so I basically lost money to the DJ, but people saw the pictures and they saw the content and go, hey, you're a professional, only book you. So that like got mm. me three gigs right off the bat. So, that, so it's kind of what they call loss leading, right? In business, you just loss put leading. the money yeah. up yeah. And, and hope and pray that it comes yeah. back to you. Yeah. Spend money to make money. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so, so that, that's that's really interesting. The the, the way uh, the, so um, okay. So, have you done any other gigs outside of like uh, the U.S. Uh, after, or did the pandemic stop you from doing that? From the DJing, yeah, that's pretty much the so, pandemic stopping. Yeah, yeah, that's that's just really surprising. But you did some things on the metaverse at least, right? Yeah, well, not, not so much DJing. I mean, I'm waiting to, to DJ my DJ debut with one of one of your projects. That'd be kind of cool. Sure. Uh, sure. But but the comedy thing, yeah, the comedy thing. I've been able to do virtual shows. I performed in Canada. I'm going to Alaska, which isn't foreign, but foreign enough for me to me uh, in April. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that's been okay. a bit more fluid. Yeah. So what what do you think about like the rise of this like uh, this metaverse stuff? I mean, I know this is this is probably a question that you usually ask me, but like, uh, yeah. what do you think about it uh, in in your industry and and stand up comedy and and being a DJ? I, I feel like yeah. I'm in the middle. I, I feel like I love hanging with with uh, people like yourself and, and and your associates because you guys are full into the metaverse or metaverse <laughs> metaverse I uh, metaverse. And, and I and, and I know it's, that it's a single word <laughs> metaverse realms. <laughs> Yeah. Interwebs. Yeah. Interwebs. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> the information superhighway. Uh, <laughs> I I am in the middle because like I understand what you guys are going through and, and what you're building and it's so much fun and and I'm willing to dive in. A lot of my friends, my IRL friends, are kind of like, "What is this? Uh, this is mm -hmm. NFTs and and crypto is fake money." But you're like, "Well, but what's real money, right?" Because if I Venmo yeah, you a thousand dollars, I'm just a Venmo you uh, text that says one thousand, right? So like, I it's kind of cool. Inflation. 
especially with oh, inflation. Yeah. Oh, so. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 I'm I'm stumbling through this, and and I and I and I totally don't get all of it. But it's cool to say I'm at that age now that I know if I shut myself off for it, I'm going to be, that's when I get to be old. When I get to be old and I go, new things, I don't understand. So just explore <laughs> and make mistakes and stuff like that. And you know, between you and I, last month, the, the bills were due and I was short and I paid my balance in crypto. Like it was, oh, wow. <laughs> it never yeah. happened before. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? But it was pretty cool to, to do that, to understand that, to know that. So yeah, it's been the trip. So one of the, the cool things about the metaverse is like it also allows you to be like not there and to have something that is not live and it's like it looks like live. You just record something like your set, but you interact as an avatar in in the metaverse. Um, and uh, what do you think about that? Like you know th that'll make your job easier, right? You know what it is. What it comes down to. This is why I'm a live entertainment professional. I, I don't edit stuff. Is I get so in my head after the fact. So okay. I, if, if I did that, that'd be a good idea, but I couldn't, I couldn't watch it. I'll put my oh. avatar there, but I'll probably mute myself and be like, oh, oh that DJ is terrible, you know? <laughs> uh, this okay. week, as we record this, my, my buddy has this late night talk show. It's called Neft After Dark. I'm not sure if you saw it on Twitter, where they basically give, yeah. give you the, the Jimmy Fallon treatment. So I was the okay. guest host. They interviewed me. We played a game and did a comedy set. And the mic wasn't the best, but like, I, I have not, watched it i showed my friends the link but i cannot go back and watch myself oh. so <laughs> is, yes, is, that it, a, is that a common thing is that a, like a, you don't watch your own movies sort of thing like with with, with uh, i, I think, I think so yeah okay there, there's some when i'm doing long form stuff like when i'm trying to do a comedy special you have to go through and see what's what works and what doesn't um mm -hmm. but when i watch myself i go that can't be my voice why am i yelling i am way too excited this is terrible, you know what I mean? So I, <laughs> no, I get short it. things That's like that, you're kind of like, there's no, there's no benefit to that. Okay. <laughs> At least to so, me. So what, what do you think about like, um, you know, the uh, recently Bruce Willis basically got hired to do a sort of a metaverse ad where uh, they didn't use him. They were only using his likeness. Like, uh, and uh, they basically CGI'd his face onto like some, some, some guy. And I forgot what the ad was, but it, they, were, they were saying it was a metaverse ad. And they're saying that's going to be the future of like entertainment. Uh, that's going to be, everyone's going to be deep fake. Um, and uh, is that dystopian for you? Or just dystopian uh, well, enough? For, first of all, it's hilarious as Bruce Willis because I know that that guy does like the bare minimum. <laughs> I know, I know, right? <laughs> I, 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 think it, I think this, that will probably be a bigger role of entertainment. But for now, we still have to establish the real person. I think we're about a generation away from a completely CGI action star in that way, because we want to follow them on Twitter and Instagram and get that. So we're kind of generations out. But yeah, if I am, if I'm global boys, like world famous comedian and Yemen calls me and go, hey, do you want to do this commercial? And I'm in Los Angeles. And I don't want to fly out. I'd be like, uh, take my face code, bro. Like, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I, there are not a lot of artists, right? But that also mean that, you know, a lot of like current artists would be competing with like the older artists, like the previous generation's artists. Like you could be like competing against Humphrey Bogart, for for example, for for, for role I don't know, with the Bogart yeah. estate. For, yeah. And, yeah, which uh, would be interesting. I'm, I'm just interested in like getting more out of like, I you know, I do technology, but like I want to I wanna hear from your view. What, what is like, uh, what concerns you most uh, in the context of technology and like the intersection of technology and entertainment? And uh, well, what do you think? It's it's the onboarding. I, I feel once things are ever written in a way that people can understand, it's already too late, right? Like I, I felt like what, when ETFs were available on Cash App, I go, well, <laughs> how many years have gone by? Or like when I get an email from Weeble saying, uh, Sheba is now available at Weeble. Oh, like, Sheba, well, yeah. you know, do you know what <laughs> I'm saying? It, it, it's, it's like that. I, that's my biggest thing I don't like. And, and, and NFTs, and, right? Like NFTs are everywhere now, but like it's, uh, we've talked about NFTs since, I don't know, like March, uh, right? Yeah, you know yeah. Like last last year, right? Right. And and NFTs and, and crypto is great if you use it as intended. Like NFT mm -hmm. is great if you have it as your own personal collection. But I, I think it, to me, I don't understand the Beanie Babies out of it. I'm just going to okay. hoard all these okay. NFTs. So one day what this monkey's going to, like, don't do that. Like yeah. that's, the, that's the whole point of it. Or, Crypto, I'm gonna buy and hold. That's that's great. Don't get me wrong, but like it's supposed to be things are supposed to have some kind of 
fluidity to it. That's why sure. value changes. And so that's that's true. That's true. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I think I think I think I think I agree. I actually I, I really agree with that. Um, a lot of people are not using it the way it should be used. Um, I have you have you tried? Um, I'm trying not to make this a crypto podcast, but have you tried like the DeFi stuff, decentralized finance stuff? Um, um where you can yeah so you don't just huddle your crypto you basically use it for something else you use it as collateral you use it oh yeah make phones. yeah so, so, so like very that. very very limited uh usually through your help and all that and, and over the last month i was trying to learn how to you know how, what i can do within the legal parameters of the united states because i'm totally doing a board sure. uh, so, so, sure. so so yeah i've been dabbling but not enough to be like oh yeah i'm all about that life you know what i mean you know, to, to check out some staking stuff and and seeing exchanges it's pretty fun it's pretty fun to learn a whole new thing a whole new language in a way will you be doing a crypto podcast soon or <laughs> I, you know, again, I'm always down to do it in New Amsterdam, but I don't think I'm a- expert enough. I'll just be there, there on the shows being like, so what? Wow. <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> actually, 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 like, like, just, just, you know, copy off the Star Trek stuff. So it's like, uh, talk about, like, I could be your co-host and we talk about crypto. And <laughs> Let's do I, it. I mean, <laughs> walk me through this. I don't know what the heck this is. <laughs> I don't know. That, that'll be fun. Anyway. Is uh, that was no. so cool? No, I'm just <laughs> No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, okay. Except for Elon for some reason. Anyway. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, uh, I guess I guess one thing that we actually haven't talked about was the time you dabbled in politics. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. this is uh, sort of off left field, but I was uh, thinking about it. And uh, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, I, 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 I don't think like you're, you're not a, I didn't, when, when I when I when I first started talking to you, I didn't um, I didn't imagine you to be someone who's like political, but you ran for council. So what, <laughs> what happened yeah, there? No, I, <laughs> on the audio version, I was shaking my head at No, I, I I'm not. I'm not. Um, my, I grew up in a two party home, um, so my dad is what they what, what they call conservative Republican, <laughs> and my and my mom is liberal or Democrat. So I never picked a side. Uh, I never got myself involved in that. Mm-hmm. Neighborhood councils in Los Angeles, every neighborhood uh, basically get the dollar per each citizen in their neighborhood to spend okay. on, on public projects. So my neighborhood okay. is called Palms. Uh, so it's 40,000 people, uh, so $40,000. But the thing about Palms is in my area of Los Angeles, the West Side, it's really made of two different people. Uh, very young, young transients that are just here to do two years and leave, and people who've been here for a long, long time. And I realized that people here for a long, long time were making choices that weren't affecting the actual demographics of the neighborhood. So I ran for a nonpartisan role as a business administrator. So I was coming okay. as a person with a few businesses in the area about how we can make our um, neighborhood great. And my dumbass, can I say that? Can I curse you? Sure, sure. Uh, totally was like, you know what? I think these businesses are great in this neighborhood, but we're scattered. We should come together and have something like a directory, a way to vertically integrate. For example, if you ran a boutique and I sold notebooks, maybe we can get together and help each other out. Um, that's what I realized. The two things I realized about politics. And one, people are very territorial. They made whatever money they made or what, whatever house they've made, and they really will shun any and everything else to make sure their little castle is complete. They're not in my yeah. backyard. I don't want those yeah, people. Oh, they're homeless, clean them out. Uh, and it was very depressing to see how people just had this disregard for their fellow citizens because they made, they worked hard because everyone feels they work hard and deserve everything. Um, and also businesses didn't want that. They didn't want to connect with other businesses. They didn't want to have that role. They wanted more trash cans in front of their building. They wanted uh, a, a direct access to cops basically. And so okay. I, I learned my platform was not the people wanted. I learned people really don't want to further the neighborhood as much as protect their own interests. And I was already jaded at the lowest level of policy. This is not city council, this is neighborhood council. And granted it was, still affiliated with LA, but it's still kind of like, oh, well, tried and failed. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> I'm out. Oh, okay. I go in detail about this in the book, too. So I All don't right. want to okay. retread it. It was like, ah. Oh. By the book, guys. <laughs> yeah, by the book. Yeah. Graduation day. Available now on Amazon. <laughs> awesome. Uh, 
but yeah, I mean, uh, the 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 thing about politics, like these days, it's been like it's it's been super partisan, and it's uh, it's getting really painful to see. Um, and uh, I think you know, like um, running as a nonpartisan. Uh, it shouldn't be more difficult, but it is more difficult, I'm guessing, yep. Uh, yep. because of the partisanship. Yeah, not so much at the neighborhood council level, but it definitely is. And, and this is like a, a team based thing. Whose team are you on? Because a lot more voters now are not willing to look per issue per issue because we vilify yep. that. Instead of we yep. saying, hey, look, the world's complex. We appreciate for different perspectives on different issues. We say, you're a hypocrite. And everyone goes, well, not me. And so they, they just vote down the party line. So you get to a certain level, maybe city council at least, and you have to decide, are you team Republican or are you team Democrat? Which yeah, yeah. I'm not against a two-party system in the United States, I still, but I wonder whether or not these two parties are still serving our communities. Much like how we don't have Whigs anymore, or we don't have Federalists anymore. Maybe we should reevaluate what it means to be one party over the other. Hmm. So um, that's happening not just in the US though, that's happening throughout the world. Um, mm -hmm. Indonesia doesn't have a two party system, it has a 30 party system now. <laughs> it's a, oh, wow. It has like, like it's, it's like you can, you can it's, it's easy to create a political party in Indonesia, it's like super easy. So uh, we have over, over 30, I think, political mm -hmm. parties in every election. And uh, so, but we're still like sort of bifurcated between like always two sides. It's uh, every single election since, uh, I guess, the early 2000s. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know, no, uh, 2010s, probably around 2010s. Like, that's 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 how, that's when it started. Um, why is this? Uh, why do you think this is? Uh, why? And, and this is not just Indonesia. It's not just the U.S. It's uh, like the world is like splitting up in like two different party lines. Um, yeah. Why do you think this is? Um, Absolutely. So for again, I'm just only one one guy. Uh, but we've tried yeah. globalism and that world peace mess. Mm. Uh, and I think well, what happens is when everyone says we're looking out for each other, we're down for helping each other with the other, which is really the intent of any kind mm -hmm. of globalist outlook. When it breaks up and there's a conflict and the country's slow to get to, or when there's an economic collapse and other countries like, well, you did it yourself, you're on your own. We go, mm -hmm. oh, well, these alliances don't really mean what it's worth on paper. Let's look into it. Let's look into what we're mm -hmm. doing. Let's protect our culture of people. It's very similar to like, let's say you had a house in the street mm -hmm. and you kept your door unlocked and you said, hey, whatever everyone, someone wants pie, you can come in and get pie whenever you want to. Mm -hmm. All you gotta mm -hmm. do is just leave a dollar for thank you. And someone comes in, takes three pies and says no money. You go, you know what? Show's over. And I think we're just doing that. We're not sharing the pies. And, and so that's why I go back to the political party system here. We have multiple parties here in the United States, Green Party or whatever, Freedom Party, all that stuff. But ultimately we go, are you conservative? Are you are you yes. on Team America? Yeah. Are you Team, yeah. the way it should be, Pax Americana? Or are you progressive? Yeah. Are you looking forward, change the way it is, pick a side because we just want to make sure yeah. what direction you want to go to. Oh. Yeah, pick a side, pick a side. That's the, I, I, I didn't think the world should be run like that. And uh, mm -hmm. I guess you don't either. And uh, I don't think, um, you know, that's the thing, like uh, we're, we're supposed to be living in the time post-information superhighway where like everyone has access to information, but like that's, uh, that's really like uh, not what, what was uh, meant to be, huh? Like, I mean, here we are, like you and me, like, sure, I'm, we're both in the U.S., but like I, I met you when I was in the in Indonesia, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that should lead to more global understanding, but that's not what happened, right? I mean, well, it happened between us, but didn't happen yeah. anywhere else. Uh, what do you think social media has to do with that? Like, you know, and this is like... You know, <laughs> Leading questions. <laughs> no, yeah, I got you. I got you. I ultimately social media is a net positive. And and hmm. it's it's hard because everyone's like, you know, social media is not real, man. And we all get that, but neither of us porn. I mean, we still watch it. I'm not saying you or I, I'm just saying in general. Uh <laughs> awkward. Uh no, but what I'm saying is when it comes to social media is that everything has a platform now. So everyone hmm. in the comedy space goes, Hey man, everyone's just too sensitive nowadays. And it hmm. looks that way. But I don't think anyone's any more sensitive now than what they were before. Book burnings are not a new thing. They've been burning books forever. Stoning right. people for being different has been happening since ancient times. It's just yep. now, no matter what you believe, you can find people who think like how you think. Um, yep. here in, and here's my dumb example I use just to, to illustrate my point. I live in Los Angeles. Like I said a billion times already in this podcast, I apologize. <laughs> 
Uh, but but in, in Los Angeles, plastic bags at the grocery store are a dime. You have to pay for your plastic bags. And I grew up in a yep. time where when you're poor in New York, especially as a minority, as a black person in New York, that bag was your proof of purchase. Because you walked outside with the groceries without a bag, people will assume you stole it. Ah, okay. So when, when LA decided to charge for the bags, I took it as a personal front. Why are you charging the bags? And, and here's about privilege and how people think of things. They go, what's the big deal for, bro? It's only 10 cents. Keep it in your car. I was like, you're assuming I have a car. I do, but I'm just saying, you're assuming I have a car. And at one point out here in LA, my, my lowest point, I had a dollar twenty-seven in my bank account. If a bag is a dime, I'm going to notice how much that bag is going to cost. Mm. cost. Mm. And the idea that I was told is it's because of, it's because of, of the environment, but mm. they still sell thicker plastic bags. Anyway, point being, I can go on social media and I can find people who agree with me. Whereas in my society okay. here, I will be forced to shut up about it. But I can go to, to Facebook and go, hey, this is dumb, right? And find a whole group that says, bag the ban. And you can mobilize and ping mm. people on Twitter. That's mm. the thing that people look at social media about. But I think everyone's had these ideas since forever. So it's a, it's, social media has just become sort of like a feedback loop. I, I don't want to use echo chamber because that's more commonly used, but like a feedback yeah. loop. Like it, it, it gives you feedback loops of everything that you believe on. Uh, and like, is, is, uh, why doesn't it... Why does it loop back? Why doesn't it balance out? Well, how how do we make social media that can balance, uh, like, you know, uh, give you other points of view? Unfortunately, that comes down to the individual. Uh, we can blame algorithms until we're blue in the face and say, you know what, my algorithm only shows me my thirty or forty friends, but you have to say, hmm, what's the other perspective on this? Look, let me know what, what's going on, and that that takes a lot more work. And that takes a lot more time. And we're just now too busy for our own good to, to actually say that different perspective. So we have our two or three sources I go to all the time. Everyone has their own. But every so often, when it's a complicated issue, you should tell yourself, this can't be the whole story. Let me find evidence to corroborate that. And I don't know how you train that. That's critical thinking. Uh, I'm not going to say, like, I am better than you because I have it. Uh, I just feel like we get so caught up in our day-to-day -day lives. You say, give me the news. Give me the update. Okay, let me go on, you know? When, when I was uh, back in high school and like early uh, college, when I was still, uh, still going there, I, I, uh, I did debate classes. And uh, during the debate classes, we were forced to basically take like uh, switch, switch sides on like any political issue. And uh, that's, that's what we were debating for. I found it very effective. Do, do people still get, do people still do that, or only do do only like ex debaters do it? <laughs> do, do you know? Like, I mean, oh, uh, no. Um, I, I think there's a little bit of a um, uh, little bit of prestige in being able to say, "Well, I think of the other perspective." People do that in conversation. Yeah, everybody. a lot of people do that, but they don't really do that, right? Yeah. I mean, I, and I'll I mean? and I'll be honest with you. Sorry, cut you off. I got a little lag. Yeah. What are you saying? I was lagged also. It's okay. It's okay. Go ahead. No, I, I want to say like, even though I used to say that in the same way, the benefit for me is these shows. Uh, I had a, a late night talk show called What's Up Little After Hours, which is now canceled. And I was challenged a bunch of times when someone says, no, this is the way it is. These people don't feel this way. And I would say, well, why, why is that? And, and different perspectives, even if I disagree with it all up and down, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if I you want me to go into issues on, on your show, but like That's that okay. to me was like, okay, Okay, I've been, so I had a couple of guests that were like, you know, the vaccines are real or like mm. transgender women aren't women or mm. like, you know, we should probably put everyone in charter schools. And those are issues I disagree no. with hardly. I think the vaccines do work. I think women mm. are women, even though I'm a guy, I can't determine that. And I'm mm. a public school graduate. I can't be like charter schools, you know what I mean? Uh, mm. but, but those are issues that I had to really think measured and with actual logic and not being like, you're crazy think about why I felt the way I did. And, and it was like a, like a sparring session in the most literal sense of the word. When it was done, I was warm and I was sweaty, but I was so oh, thankful wow. that someone mm -hmm. attacked me to be like, why do I feel the way I do? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, Yeah, that, that, it's, it, requires some, it requires some degree of discomfort, right? Like these things, because you're, yeah. you're, when, when you believe something you are, and when you believe something in your, in your feedback loop or echo chamber or whatever, you're in, you're in your comfort zone and uh, getting out of that is not comfortable, right? So mm -hmm. should, uh, I don't know. I mean, I mean we're, I'm not gonna 
try to solve the problems of the U.S. in like one one show, but like <laughs> we, should. <laughs> <laughs> we should. But I mean, I I I think there's a way to do that in a way that is like more structured, as in um, yeah. uh, I don't know. Probably the education system needs to be focused on um, actually having debates. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean. The, the the bait club kids there there's always going to be the bait club kids I'm not talking about that I'm I'm talking right. about like people who debate those are those are people who debate for sport right just mm -hmm. uh and and this is an opinion and uh I, I, if I'm host today I'm not supposed to I probably focus on my opinions but my opinion is uh it should be part of like the general curriculum like uh, everyone should be taught how to debate their themselves even and. Uh, yeah. Going back to logic. Yeah. yeah. The the it's, it's the what about ism, you know. Hey, look, you know, this is this is really affecting us. But what about <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the what about ism. Yeah. I mean, uh, I saw, uh, and people argue online, and uh, a lot of a lot of these spaces. I, I guess Twitter, Facebook are are like the 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 place where people debate the most. I think uh, out of all the social media is actually Twitter, right? This is. Uh, yeah. Compared to Facebook, compared to like the other uh, uh, places, um, but it also breeds sort of like this toxic culture of like um, you know uh, shaming and canceling. Um, right. And and what do you, what do you think about that? Uh, um, I mean, that's that's another side of the coin, right? Like you know, you 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 get face to face with like people who are not like like you, and you you mm -hmm. cancel. And, uh... Yeah. Well, for for celebrities, I can't think of a celebrity who really got canceled. <laughs> so it's a little different because okay. celebrities could play like I'm bringing the cancel culture to me, but like they didn't have a website the next week, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, but, yeah. but but for, for, regular, people, for, us, for, for people like us, like yeah, when you get canceled, like let's say you have one outburst and and they tell your work and they kick you off out of a job, it can be really rough, and and there is a bit of fear, especially. For someone like myself, not say I'm a public figure, but I do things with my face forward online. Mm -hmm. If someone dug up an uh, old tweet or something like mm -hmm. that, I'm not even worried about what I said because I'm totally vanilla and I'm a square. But sometimes things can change, like perception can mm -hmm. change. Things that was perception a, a joke yeah. four years ago. Yeah. yeah. So I, I worry about that all the time. It is kind of crazy. And history has told us things like that always seem to be a pendulum. We worry, worry, mm -hmm. worry until we don't anymore. I am not sure what that means here in social media because we've seen that weaponized on so many different times, so many different things, but it's a legit fear I have that someone says, hey, you know, when you were mad about getting cut off in traffic, you said people in LA can't drive and you want to run for mayor for LA, how dare you? And it's like, mm -hmm. ah, eh. <laughs> I was 25. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. We, we've all said dumb things. That's, that's the thing. Like you can't get canceled for it. You shouldn't be. And uh, the, and and that's that's sort of like the danger of like the, from my the, the my side of like the the I guess from my side of like the industry, Web three right crypto. Uh, we're trying to make everyone have like no longer centralized power. Everyone everything's decentralized, so everyone's opinion sort of matter. But that also means you can um, mob someone. Like if you're if you're uh, if uh, if everyone in the space has the same opinion about something. They can cancel people uh, in mm -hmm. in that space, and uh, that's Absolutely. that's sort of like it's it's sort, of, sort of like you know um, mobbing someone. Um, have you heard of DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and uh, those those are those are uh, those are a community, but that 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 have the decision making prowess of an organization of a of a of a company, of an investment firm, even in some cases, and. Uh, I don't know. I, I we probably don't have a solution right now, but like, uh, we're, it's uh, there's always like uh, either either or, right? Like, there's always a balance between these things, uh, centralization and decentralization. But like the decentralization part, I'm I'm feeling that uh, we need to find a way to uh, solve the problems of how humans interact. But at the same time, I'm pretty sure like that's how humans interact. Like uh, if we we try to force them to do something else that's not going to be natural for them, not going to be sustainable either. Yeah. yeah. One of the, the things, well, I always say this, and this is my philosophy, like people just want to be safe. 
they want to pay their bills, they want to love, right? So mm-hmm. if everyone if everyone wants to do the thing, I'm always great. But what I've noticed when it comes to educating people, especially here in this country, is that mm-hmm. if there is a, a slight of a mention of a greater good, people will reject it. Hey, it's for the greater good, but I am an individual. I'm a free thinker. I'm a, I was like, no one's asking, no one's trying to like to have dominion over you. Like we're a country where at the very worst, we get you fired from a job. No one's throwing you in a dungeon and locking you up with shackles. If you say, hey, look, learn about this concept or hey, put on this mask. That's right, I said it. Uh, but people get kind of thinking about that. So as long as we educate them in a way as like, hey man, do at your leisure, you could do it. Like. Maybe they'll they'll bite on it and get more of an appreciation for that for sure. Hmm. Okay, um, I we have talked for forty five minutes. Uh, you haven't told me like one thing that actually started this conversation. Um, Twenty six stone, your first podcast. Uh, so yeah. you were larger as a child. Uh huh. Yep. How how did how did you uh how did you slim down? <laughs> I mean, how how did you uh change like how Okay, just tell me your story. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. So, so twenty six stone. At the, again, at my heaviest, I used to weigh twenty six point nine stone. So, specifically twenty seven stone, but twenty six sounded way cooler. How, how um, much is I was, that in pounds, by the way? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's it's an English weight. It's like three hundred and seventy five pounds, basically. Okay. Is how, okay. Much, how much I weighed. So, uh, just for reference, my my shirts were six extra large, and uh, oh, my jeans okay. were fifty six inches around the waist, oh, and. Okay. Uh, I was at my heaviest at 24. So I was in grad school at the time. So I was in, in Orange County. In a lot of ways, California saved my life because the state's all image conscious and you can go to a mm-hmm. restaurant and be like, do you have any kale? And they do, which is great. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was always a big kid. Portion control was the worst. Uh, I just kept eating and eating. And I went to undergrad college in Florida for the first time. I had a full meal plan. Mm-hmm. So basically it was like three buffets a day and I just couldn't stop. Uh, and oh. it, it was... Yeah, it was, uh, it was a bad time. And of course, I had bad acne and I sweat all the time. And of course, no one wanted to date me because I was so large. Uh, what changed was when I was my second year in film school, I got a gym membership to one of those gyms that don't close. So I used to like, uh-huh. slip out at midnight and work an hour and slip back in so no one saw me because if I failed at it, then no one would know. And uh, I didn't know much about food because I was still eating burgers all the time. So I switched to Subway. So the, the first 80 pounds of that 150 pounds that I lost, I lost through the Subway diet. Uh, back oh. when the, the footlongs were $5. This is like years ago. I would go and put $5 down, get a little Subway club and uh, slim down that way. Wow. And um, how, how do you motivate yourself to do it? So everyone is different and it changes. Sometimes I'm narcissistic. Sometimes I'm like, well, you know what? It's beach body season. Sometimes I go, it's for your health and your circulation. But uh, you think during... I get selfies? Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> when you say I'm not a selfie guy. Selfie. I, okay. No, I'm, I'm more like, I'm more like, you know, I got to make sure I, I, I do these sit-ups because I want to make sure that my chests are great for the ladies. Not, not like that. All right. <laughs> like, okay. like, totally that way. I'm not, not, not like, mm, All right. gorgeous. <laughs> Yeah, like a secret. I, like, I, was, I was thinking he has a secret Instagram account or something that just like promo <laughs> down. <laughs> right. Okay. No. But, but the big me, in, 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 <laughs> yeah, just be narcissistic as possible. <laughs> just, <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, oh, the, yeah. The biggest motivator for me though was when I was trying to get to running because running was like effective because it's free and all that. I <laughs> said. Look, the, the worst people on the planet, like hardened criminals, the worst, mm-hmm. the worst punishment they can give you is solitary confinement. And that's 23 okay. hours in a room. That's basically what they can do, right? Mm-hmm. But that one hour you get a day is for exercise. So if mm-hmm. criminals are deserving of exercise, why mm-hmm. not me? What excuse do I have to not give myself an hour to well. work out? And that was the main motive that I did for me. I know for some, it could be a little harsh, but that was for me being like, you know, I could do this. I, 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 I'm actually really motivated from, from this. <laughs> I'm so sorry. What happened again? <laughs> oh, I know. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I, guess, I guess that's all, all the questions that I actually have in my list over here. Uh, do you have anything else to add uh, before we close it? 
Absolutely. Love one another, man. We're all here trying to do the same thing and survive and pay these bills. <laughs> uh, graduation day, uh, real start, true starts from the real world, life lessons from the real world, excuse me, available now on Amazon. Please get a copy. Let me know what you think. Yes, I went to Italy to DJ. Can you imagine that? And hey, check out these interests. She's doing a bunch of stuff on the metaverse <laughs> and cyberspace and all that. We're going to probably collab in the future for more metaverse events. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks for being here, Flavo. Thank you.